Hello and welcome to an end of year almost breaking news here on the Everything Electric show. As I'm sure some of you are aware, 2024 has been a year of incredible growth in three very important sectors. Electric ground transport, obviously, renewable energy production and of course grid scale electricity storage. As we have reported many times this year, the panicked cries from some parts of the British and American traditional press about the collapse in sales, collapse, that's the word they used, in sales of electric cars, have been based entirely on press releases from the fossil fuel lobby and not from actual statistics and data. Sales have increased this year all across Europe, China, India and the USA. And as for renewables, in the last 12 months, we passed 30% of total global electricity consumption. The whole world, all the electricity consumed everywhere, 30% of it was being supplied by renewable energy generation. If you include all forms of zero carbon electricity generation, hydro, nuclear, etc., these energy sources generated 51% of the global electricity used in 2023. The biggest loss in terms of grubby electricity generation around the world, not just in Europe and the USA, is coal. So there are genuine reasons to celebrate the incredible work going on around the world. But of course, we are up against staggering challenges, not just economic and technological, but of course, political and philosophical. But this pre-holiday episode is going to be 100% optimistic. I'm not going to slip up and do a story about some fossil fuel funded dirty backhanders and political corruption. I'll save all that really salty stuff for 2025. Love the Everything Electric show? Then join us live in Sydney in March, London in April, or in Vancouver, Farnborough and Melbourne in September, October and November 2025. First story. Now, we talk a lot about battery recycling at the Everything Electric Show, and it's critically important. Part of the part of the energy transition, it's vital. But as we all know, batteries don't just die. They don't conk out like an old combustion engine. They start to very slowly become non-viable in a vehicle. The range drops too much. Not after two, three, four years. No, after 15 years and, and a half a million miles. But there's nothing new about the idea of using old electric car batteries repackaged as static electric storage systems. It's been talked about a lot, but because the batteries in cars last way, way, way longer than anyone anticipated, it's taken a while to have a big enough supply to build second life systems at scale uh, for batteries to do something else after you take them out of the cars. So the Johan Cruyff Sports Arena in Amsterdam was one of the first I knew of. They used 148 old Nissan Leaf batteries, which powered the building. And it's a very big building. Charged by, among other things, renewable sources from the 4,200 solar panels on the arena's roof. They can supply enough power for 5,000 Dutch houses, or a massive football arena. The old Nissan batteries can store four megawatt hours. But hey now, the new battery that's just come online in West Texas is a 53 megawatt hour project located right next to a massive wind farm. This project, built by a startup called Element Energy, has been running since May this year. But they've only just made this project public. So this is really good. I love stories like this. This is not something they could do or might do. This is something they have done. It's already working. They buy bulk batteries in various states of health from different manufacturers, then repackage them into containers using their own software, which fine-tune commands at the cell level. It doesn't treat all the battery packs as one monolithic whole. It goes down to each individual cell. If one of those is a bit dodgy, it can either bypass it or make it healthier. This enables the system to get more use out of each cell without stressing any so much that they need replacing. Uh, And they're in the early stages of site selection to build a factory capable of assembling multiple gigawatt hours of used battery enclosures every year. And next year, they're planning on opening their first gigawatt hour battery array, all second-hand batteries, all second life. That's also going to be in Texas. Texas is like, uh, it's it's the absolute home of renewable energy. (laughs) Who knew? 
We made an episode of the Fully Charged Show when Shell installed its first rapid charger at a petrol slash gas forecourt in North London. It was one charger, mainly used by electric London taxi drivers. Not long after that, they closed down a profitable petrol forecourt in West London and replaced it with multiple rapid chargers and nice facilities. I've been there a few times to top up various cars we've been filming in London. I'm assuming it's a success, as Shell have recently announced they are closing 1,000 filling stations service stations, call them what you will, across Europe, including the UK, and they're converting them to electron filling stations. Now, they are not new to EV charging. The Shell Recharge EV charging division is operating around 54,000 public chargers around the world. They have plans in place to have over 200,000 of these chargers online by 2030. So closing 1,000 gas stations sounds like a massive step. And it's really important they do this. But for balance, I always like to be balanced, that only represents 4% of the total number of gas stations, filling stations, petrol forecourts, that they operate. 4%. All right, no, I'm not going to diss them. They're doing it. It's really good. Even as a vociferous critic of the oil industry, I've, I have regularly used Shell recharge stations around the place, not because they're cheap, which they're definitely not, but because they're kind of reliable and very easy to use. Plug in, tap your card, beep, starts charging. They start charging your money, but at least they start charging your car as well. I'm staying very positive, and this is another quick story about public charge points for EVs, this time in the USA. Now, not long ago, I did hear some American shock jock, one I've actually met many years ago, pontificate about how amazing the Tesla supercharger network is, which is, of course, true, but then drone on and on. Oh, my God, it was boring about how hopeless the federal government backed efforts to install public chargers has been. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of how these chargers are going in, but this gentleman claimed that they'd only installed eight chargers eight total charges in four years at a cost of like $1.5 billion compared to the 27,000 Tesla superchargers already operating in the United States. It turns out, shocking this is, you'll be shocked. It turns out they were a little off in their figures. They said eight because it sounds good. They spent $1.5 billion and they only put in eight. Well, here's a shock. People who are very closely financially aligned to Tesla telling little porkies. Who knew such a thing was possible? I certainly wouldn't have expected it. It turns out there are slightly more than eight charges in North America. In fact, there are over 192,000, with around 1,000 being installed every week. That's a slightly different picture painted there. We hope to be able to report on this in more detail next year, but it's very positive news. Next story. The Nullarbor. Now that is a desert in southwestern Australia. It's quite big, roughly 200,000 square kilometers, just a little bit smaller than the entire UK. Now there's a lot of heat, a lot of sand and scrub, a couple of roads and a few scattered road houses in the Nullarbor. Now I've always wanted to drive across on the Air Highway, which runs from Norseman in Western Australia to Port Augusta in South Australia. Loads of electric car drivers have done it. I thought I'd be the first. No way. It is possible as there now are chargers all the way along the road. But finally, something fairly massive is about to appear in the Nullarbor. In fact, it will be the biggest combined wind and solar power installation, wait for it, in the world. Currently, the Gansu Wind Farm in China is the largest on Earth, located on the outskirts of the Gobi Desert. It has a generating capacity of 20 gigawatts. I mean, that is mind-boggling huge. In Australia, the Western Green Energy Hub, as it will be called, will have a generating capacity of 70 gigawatts. That's 50 gigawatts more than the one in China. 70 gigawatts. That is more electricity than the UK 
ever, ever consumes. At peak time in the winter, when everyone's gone home really depressed and switched on all their lights and their heating and boiled a kettle and got heated the water and done the cooking and turned the oven on, oven on and used the, everything. This is a joint project between a Singapore-based company, CWP Global, and Merning Green Energy, which represents indigenous landowners all over Australia. Now, as we've seen in Canada recently, it is critically important to include First Nations in these huge developments. They can really make a big financial difference to the people who are the traditional guardians of this land. However, we are going to see bigger and bigger energy hubs like this around the world. And there's one very obvious reason why these uh, systems will overcome any and all political shenanigans. It might take five years and cost billions of dollars to build this 70 gigawatt facility five years and let's say two or three billion dollars it's huge it's a huge project now to build the same generating capacity using say coal gas or oil just isn't going to happen it makes zero economic sense apart from the fact that it's filthy dirty and we're not going to use those technologies anymore to build the same generating capacity using nuclear power would require us to build 20 to 25 massive new nuclear power plants, each at around 46 billion pounds, which is about uh, 55 billion dollars. So a total of 920 billion pounds or over a tr yeah, just off the scale. I can't even be bothered to try and work out. It would take about 25 to 30 years to complete, and the resulting electricity will be so eye-wateringly expensive, no one is going to buy it. It's called capitalism. Anyway, next story. Delivery vans. Now, there's loads of them in the UK. We all increasingly rely on them, and most of them still burn diesel. But change is coming fast. As of September 2024, there were over 65,000 electric delivery vans in use in the UK. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it's still only 1.4% of all light commercial vehicles on the road. But as always, in a transition, it's been slow to start, but now things are really ramping up. The cost difference between the cheapest diesel van and the electric equivalent is shrinking fast. And according to new analysis by Transport and Environment and the Clean Cities campaign, by 2026 there will be more e-van models available than diesel and petrol ones, and battery electric vans will be cheaper to buy than their diesel counterparts by 2027. And this analysis does not suppose that all the electric vans we need will be made in China. In fact, this is the one area where locally based companies are supplying all the electric needs of the European market, which of course actually includes the UK, but don't tell anyone. It's also worth bearing in mind there are national and local regulations which will make using a diesel van increasingly difficult. Things like low and zero emission zones in big towns and cities, these are not going to go away. In fact, they're all set to cover a larger area and be stricter in the, uh, in the types of vehicles that they allow in. Air quality in London has actually measurably improved since the number of electric vans, buses, garbage trucks, etc. has increased. We can make things better. Next story. And now a last minute update. This news wasn't out for the original recording of this episode. Jaguar. Yes, Jaguar. This classic brand, a favorite for the older, you know, conservative with a small C, male clientele. Few of my mates have got Jags. I know what I'm talking about. So as I'm sure many of you know, Jaguar recently launched a thing. I, I can't really call it an advert. It was a sort of weird piece of art college foundation course video for a, for a kind of video installation. I truly can't be bothered to have a, an opinion about it, but I suppose the gist of what that uh, thing was trying to say was that Jaguar don't want to copy anyone. And that is surely a good thing. Be original. Fantastic. But the good old Daily Mail really lost the plot over this. It didn't feature a car in any way. Now, Jaguar have actually released images of the actual car, and I suppose you can say that they haven't copied anyone. But our very own Imogen Bogle made a rather pertinent point recently, and after all, she used to work at Jaguar. 
Jaguar are a luxury car maker. They don't sell cheap cars and they never have. Also, their current customer base are pretty old, like my age and above. We're not going to be around for very long to buy new Jaguars. This advert has been seen by literally millions of people all around the world, most of them utterly baffled. The vast majority, and I'm talking 99.9% .9 of people who watch that, will never, and I, would, uh, and, I, and I underline, never buy a Jaguar. But at 0.1% is enough for them to sell maybe 50 or 60,000 very expensive cars. And that's all they need to do. So we can froth and scream and stamp our feet and say it's the end of motoring. It doesn't matter a toss. Of course, they're very late to the party because this is obviously an electric car. And I've just test driven a car that's been around for a while. It's sold close to 2 million cars and has just had an intriguing upgrade. Now, when Top Gear magazine announced that this car has now a range of 436 miles on a charge, I thought I'd give it a go. So I'm driving along a route I know very, very well. I would first have driven along here in an electric car about 13 or 14 years ago in a Nissan Leaf. I couldn't do this whole journey in one go because of the range limitation, particularly at this time of year, it's quite cold. Uh, I would have to stop at the services, uh, on motorway services about uh, 20 miles ahead of where I am now and charge again to get home. We've moved on. Uh, technology in the electric vehicle space is not static. And I am now in the Tesla Model 3 rear wheel drive long range. This vehicle, so Tesla claims, can get 436 miles on one charge. So I'm really intrigued to see how this goes. And what was fortunate with the loan of this car, literally just picked it up, it's brand new, it's done under 400 miles in total since it was made. Uh, but what had happened is this coming weekend, we are going to visit two friends at the different, on different days who live quite a long way from where we do. And I've worked out that the entire trip from our house to the th two locations, back to London, back to our house, is around 400 miles. And I am not confident, <laughs> but I'm gonna give it a go. So, we did our long trip, and it all went fine. Everything was fine. There was no problem, it was all fine. And I mean, I think it's important to remind viewers, I'm very used to driving the Tesla Model 3. So I've had two of them. I've driven, I don't know what, well over 150,000 miles of them. So I'm very used to them. So the whole trip was 368 miles. Uh, once we got to our destination, which was in Hastings, um, which was kind of half, I guess that was halfway, because we drove to Hastings, we drove via a lot of other places, got to Hastings, met up with an old friend, which was fantastic, had a lovely time, uh, and then drove back at night. Um, I didn't do all the, we did this over, over two days. Uh, 368 miles was the total journey distance, which according to Top Gear, should be able to do, <laughs> Top Gear magazine, just want to remind you of that, not the TV show, um, couldn't do, we wouldn't have been able to do that, so we had to stop and uh, use a supercharger on the way home, which was incredibly easy, and we also only needed it, I think we were plugged in for 14 minutes, and that gave us plenty of extra juice to get us home. So it was not a problem at all, it's just that it didn't do that mileage. Well, since I've had the car, I've now been sent um, a photograph of someone who had has one of these in the United States, and he managed to drive 402 miles on one charge. So that was a little bit disappointing because I was looking forward to seeing how differently this car behaved. But, uh, you know, other than that, everything about it is, is incredible. Anyway, 
that's enough. I uh, just want to say that I really hope you have a lovely break uh, you, and you get the chance to have a lovely break over the Christmas holidays and the new year. I'd like to wish you a happy new year in case I'm not on the screens before the new year. We've got an enormous amount of stuff we've already made that we're releasing next year. Uh, so it's always worth it if you get the chance to subscribe to the uh, Everything Electric show and also the Fully Charged show. Uh, please tell your friends about it. And uh, that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching.